What is Daniel 9 talking about? And it's talking about the most amazing prophetic chapter in the whole Bible. And, and the only thing I want to remind you of before we dig into Ezekiel is this, that God wants us to know about the future. Think about it, that it, it's not Hal Lindsey that thought all this up. It, it's not John Walvert of Dallas Seminary that thought all this up. It's not even J.N. Darby of the Plymouth Brethren that thought all this up. God is the one who in the book of Isaiah said, test me to know that I am the Lord. Do you know the things that are going to happen in the future? Because only I do, saith the Lord. And so what, what we see is prophecy was built by God for the purpose of helping us know the future. And so it, it's not like it's the fringe of Christendom that's into this. God is into it. And he's devoted, as we saw last week, a fourth of his book into uh, things to come. And so real quickly, what we saw in, in Daniel 9, the most amazing prophetic chapter in the Bible is this. There's so many pieces. Um, those four verses, 24, 25, and 26, and 27, basically tell us the scope of history, then specifically the 483 years, the church age, we would call it, it's just a, an interval, and then the last seven years. Uh, the scope is, God says he's determined that there are 490 years of history that revolve around the Jewish people. Remember, in God's map, Jerusalem's in the center, his people. His chosen people of promise. Uh, and it surrounds the Jews in Jerusalem. It lasts 483 years. You say, how do you get 483 years? Well, it says, uh, there shall be uh, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Um, seven plus 62 makes 69 weeks. And if you look, uh, 69 times seven uh, weeks of years. And by the way, if you want to track this down, you'll find that this word that's used here is used in other parts of the Old Testament for kind of like we would use dozens, and it uses sevens. But that's where we come with the 483 years. And uh, the third part is, notice the wording, after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So we know that's the crucifixion. Um, the crucifixion takes place after this time period. But this time period, if you if you look here, there are 69 weeks that are talked about that are from the, the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until actually God's counter ended on Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is a bigger deal. It, you know, I mean, it's the, the triumphal entry of Christ. You know, some people wonder if it's really on Sunday, but it doesn't matter. What we call Palm Sunday is very big in God's calendar. It's the end of this period of his plans for Israel. And it ended when they, as it were, rejected Jesus as their king. They, they rejected him. And so following that, the time clock stopped, but Christ was crucified and Jerusalem was destroyed. And there's an indeterminate amount of time. It's, it's called an interval. It's just God says... 69 weeks, one week. And that's what makes 70. But between the end of the 69th right here and the beginning of the final one, the 70th, is an indeterminate amount of time. And you say, well, what's it for? It's what the Bible calls till the fullness of the Gentiles shall come in. And I love it that some Bible teachers say that, that God has this, this clock uh, this counting clock, and it's counting up time and people that are coming, and when the last one that he desires to enter into the church of Christ enters, boom. I mean, you're going to be out. In fact, uh, if you want to, it says hastening the day of the Lord. You want to hasten the day of the Lord, lead people to the Lord, because you hasten when the last one that he has chosen for this time period to be saved is saved, boom. Then he takes his church out, and it starts that 70th week. So, we already covered this last week. The last seven years uh, is, is in Daniel 9, 27. And he, that's the prince that shall come, shall enforce the covenant with the many for one week. And see, this, this whole uh, Daniel 9 thing is built around these heptads, these weeks of years, seven years. And so he's going to enforce a covenant for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, 
the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and determination will be poured out in the desolate. I mean, all that is saying is everything that it chronicles, when you look at Revelation 13, and you, you see this Antichrist coming, and this image he sets up of himself, and the, the uh, breaking of the covenant, and, and tricking the Jewish people who were trusting in the false Messiah. And I'm looking forward in a, in a couple of weeks when we get on Sunday morning to the first seal of Revelation 6. The first seal is a white horse. The first event that the Lord unfolds for us is the rise of this man that is the ultimate superman in every way. Super intellect, super communicator, super uh, you know, mesmerizer of audiences. I mean, Hitler could keep the Munich Stadium absolutely mesmerized with his orations and his everything he did. This fellow will be able to mesmerize not just, you know, Munich or, or uh, Germany. He will mesmerize the world and, and will give everybody what they always wanted uh, for a while. Uh, so that led us to the second question, where does this term seven-year tribulation come from? It's right there. It's this idea that, that God had 483 years, whoop, 483 years, or uh, 69 heptads that ended, and there's this interval, but the last section, the last week, the 70th week, is seven years long. And this, this 70th week period is called uh, the, the tribulation or the, as it says in chapter 6 on, uh, at the end of 6, the great tribulation. Uh, now, this is something that we're going to cover tonight. There is a prophesied two-chapter event in Ezekiel that, that describes the Magog invasion of Israel. The, you notice this and this and this? It's not clear in the Bible when it takes place. And so what we're going to do tonight is just, you know, it, it's understand what's going to happen, understand the, the participants, but we don't know if it, if it falls right here before the tribulation. It could actually happen. It, it isn't clear whether it happens uh, you know, sometime in, in you know, like, like near the time of Armageddon, any time during the week, before the week, uh, it's just not clear, and I'll show you why. But what we do know is that there's a rebuilt temple in this time period because in the center at the three and a half year mark, right here, right in the center of the tribulation, the Antichrist uh, defiles, sets up the image of himself, and and uh, breaks the covenant and all the things we read about in Revelation. So this is where the seven-year tribulation comes from. It's that 70th week that is, that is culminated by the battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. And that launches into the personal direct rule of Christ called the millennium. Okay, now what's interesting, go to Daniel 10. I want to show you something because uh, I wanted to throw this in because someone mentioned it. Probably uh, they were reading Peretti books or something, you know, I don't know. But look in Daniel 10, because where did this idea of spiritual warfare on a global scale come from? And, and sometimes we, we uh, in our reading this, we don't really notice some of the things that, that it's talking about. Uh, first of all, in Daniel 10, if you read the whole chapter, you see that, that Daniel is fasting for three weeks. Now, that immediately, um, when Jesus' disciples confronted a very powerful demon situation, Jesus said to them, this kind cometh not, but by what? Yeah. This kind cometh not, but by, remember, God always puts this word first, and fasting. Uh, prayer, in God's book, is always first but we will give ourselves to prayer in the ministry of the word. This kind cometh not but by prayer and by fasting. And so prayer is, is a reference to our seeking God 
Fasting is us denying ourself, our flesh. Uh, you know, the, the idea of um, that, that I am so weak, I need to seek God's strength, and I am, my flesh is so strong, I need to deny it. So first I start seeking the Lord, and then I start, you know, denying uh, the, the, the enemy within, the traitor, my flesh. So Daniel is, is already seeking the Lord, and he goes into this three-week fast, and the Lord dispatches a messenger to him, but for the whole fasting period, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now, you know what's so interesting? Movie makers read the Bible. I mean, that was a movie a while back, The Prince of Persia, and I thought, do they know what they're talking about? Because there is a demon that is, that is behind this moment, what the Persians are doing in their hatred of Israel. And it is so interesting to think about the dark side, what we, you know, we don't even realize so much of, of, of it's not just uh, nation states buying, uh, you know, hypersonic missiles and, and Israel intercepting them and blowing them up last week. There's so much more going on, on the spiritual realm, that God Interestingly enough, in this chapter is one of the only places in the Bible, I mean, other than Job 1 and 2 that we've already looked at, pulls back for a moment the curtain because he wants us to know that there is so much going on that this is why the Bible says God is watching over his word to perform it because Satan doesn't understand the Bible and doesn't know what God is doing, but he's going to try and stop it at every hand. And so there is this this higher level of warfare. And so this prince of the kingdom of Persia, this, this order of demon creatures, remember Paul describes seven orders of demons, prince valleys and powers, and you know, he goes through all these you know, spiritual weakness in high places when he's talking about it. And if you add them up with the ones that are in the Old Testament, it appears that there are seven orders of demons that reflect the seven orders, you know, cherubim and seraphim and the archangel, Lucifer that was the anointed cherub. I mean, you know four right off, top, plus normal angels. So, um, but, but uh, until Michael, and Michael is the one that seems to always be the defender of God's chosen people who promised the Jews. So Michael comes in and, and uh, this messenger going to that's on his way to Daniel, is hindered by this, this being. So Michael uh, comes and assists this angel to get to Daniel. And after giving Daniel, after that messenger gets to Daniel, this angel, and gives him chapter 11 and 12, he will have to deal with, and here's another one, appears to be one of these hierarchy of demons that is, that is influencing the nation of Greece. So all, all that to say, in a little while when we're looking at the maps, uh, we think of armies and soldiers and political leaders, and God sees overlaid over all that. Satan is just like in Job. Satan incited the Sabaeans to go and attack Job's flocks. Satan incited, and, and if you read, Satan can actually incite people groups to, to terrorize and kill and fight and war. He can drive them, just like the demon of Gadara, the de demonized man. So this is very interesting, but I, I just wanted you to see where that comes from. Now, now let's go to Ezekiel 36, and um, that's really where uh, we were headed tonight and where we'll spend uh, uh, the next few minutes. But I want you to see one, one of the most amazing little stretches of the Scripture. In fact, one of the more uh, hard-to-understand parts, especially Ezekiel 40 to 48, the temple and all that. But the question was, what is Ezekiel 36 through 39 describing? And, and actually what they wanted uh, was the chapter 38 and 39. But since 
they ask about 36, I thought we'd get a running start. And what they want to know is, who are the biblically described players in this event, and are Russia and Iran part of them? And I want well, let's just walk through Ezekiel 36. If you're there in your Bible, probably my favorite verse in the whole 36 uh, chapter is 26 and 27. You'll hear me say this often at communion. It's a good verse to memorize. This is the new covenant. I will give you, Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take away the heart of stone out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You'll keep my commandments and do them. That's the new covenant. By the way, the new covenant was made, first of all, with Israel. And this is a future event when Israel is going to get a new heart and a new spirit. They don't have it now. They're very secular, very pagan. They think they're winning the war themselves. But in the midst of this description of what God's going to do in the future, he brought up this great new covenant promise, which is what the New Testament writers began describing is what happens in us when we're saved. We get a new heart. In fact, this morning, if you're a born-again believer, you've had a heart transplant. You want to shock someone if you're younger? Uh, you know, talk to a group of people, and, and they're all talking about their knee transplants, you know, and their hip transplants and everything. You say, I've had a heart transplant. Especially if you look like you're in your 20s or something. They'll look at you and say, what? You say, oh, yeah, I have a heart transplant. They said, what is that? Look at verse 26. A new heart also I'll give you, a new spirit I'll put within you. And you can explain to them that the only way to have peace and joy and everlasting life and, and to have tranquility in your life is to get a heart transplant. That's what God does. The new birth is not joining a church or getting baptized or you know, repeating a prayer after me. It's when God gives you a new operating system. When he reaches in and takes out the old stony, as it's talking about in 26 and 27, and puts a brand new operating system in us. We are brand new from the core of our being. We have a brand new orientation in life and spiritual life. But that's the 36th chapter. But surrounding all that is something else. Let me just walk through it with you. Ezekiel 36 pictures the exiled Israelites scattered around like a pile of bones. By the time we get to chapter 37, look what it says there. And the Lord came upon me and brought me by the Spirit to a valley, and he saw this valley of dry bones. So in chapter 36 is the run-up to the pile of bones in 37. And, and 36 talks about it because of their disobedience and sin and because of their idolatry. God causes judgment promised judgment from the Pentateuch to fall on Israel. So by the time we get to 37, there's this dry and dead pile of bones in this desert valley. It's almost like an old western, you know, you can imagine Death Valley and a pile of steer heads, you know, and that's what it looks like. That's what I see in my mind. That's how God looked at Israel. And then chapter 37 describes the call of God that begins to stir and draw Jews from all over the world. And, and what it says is that, that all of a sudden these bones start, start coming together. They're, 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 instead of being scattered over the whole valley, they're starting to coalesce and, and join and merge. And all of a sudden, the skeletons form into human skeletons. It's just a very kind of Halloween picture, I guess. But what really is happening is that's describing the events that began in the late 19th century. Jews began migrating to the area now called Israel. By the mid-20th century, they became a recognized nation called Israel. So chapter 37 actually has happened in some of your lifetimes, and, and it's in recent history for the rest of us. This happened in 1948, that, they, that the bones came together, and there, there was this nation of Israel then, uh, you know that what happened, 48 uh, started Israel, 56 was the great war where all the Arabs decided they were going to get rid of them after eight years. Then 67 was the next great war, 11 years later, and all of, of the world watched as they thought Israel was going to be annihilated, and Israel defeated the combined armies of all those nations. This is all history. But look at chapter 38, because directly following this description of this this nation of Israel, all of a sudden we have Ezekiel 38. It follows the description of this return of the nation Israel to, to becoming a country. And in Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's a war described by God through Ezekiel's eyes that features armies coming from what we would describe as an Islamic coalition. 
Now remember this, Ezekiel is talking from the, con- from the context of 2,600 years ago. So he's going to describe places that were geographically recognizable 2,600 years ago. And if you get an old map, just find a, a map that describes what the world was like pre uh, Rome and pre, you know, the modern times, and look back at the ancient world, and what you find is Ezekiel is picking, picking out geographic sites that are still identifiable on the map. And if you look at that, today, those geogra- see what's neat about the Bible is it takes a place from then to identify a geographic location. If you overlay today's geopolitical map over it, you find that everywhere Ezekiel describes would be an Islamic nation or Russia. Every one of them. So we call it an Islamic confederation allied with what today we call Russia. But back then they were the Scythians and there are a lot of other words in there. This event is described, this, this war starting in chapter 38. Look what it says, Ezekiel 38.1. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, So we know this is going to happen because God's saying it, the word of the Lord. That's code for God says. And if God says, it's going to happen. Son of man, verse 2, set your face against Gog and the land of Magog and the prince of Rosh and Meshach and Tubal, the prophesy against him. And thus says the Lord, and he keeps going down. And look at verse 5. This is what I keep talking about, the the leader of the the band. Verse 5, Persia. That's Iran. They're the start of this list that's coming against Israel. So basically, 38 and 39 describe a massive attack launched against whatever the nation is in 36 and 37. 36 and 37 clearly describes Israel. 38 and 39 clearly describes Israel being attacked from without by what we would say in the 21st century, an Islamic coalition. So the first question we have is, when would this happen to be? And so you do a Bible study. Over the years, various Bible teachers have looked. Look at, look at what it says in verse 2, Gog and Magog. So obviously there are two unusual words you can search in the Bible. And what you find is that there are three times Gog and Magog occur in the Bible. So we have to identify when exactly would this chapter 38 happen. The first place that Gog and Magog show up in the Bible is in Revelation chapter 19. And 19, 11 through 21 say that Gog and Magog come up in a battle called Armageddon. But the interesting thing is that Armageddon is seen to be at the end of the seven-year time of trouble that's called the Tribulation. And when, when this, the battle of Gog and Magog and Armageddon ends, the world as we know it ends. There's no seven years of... If, if you read Ezekiel 38, after this war, they're cleaning up for seven years after the war of chapter 38 and 39. They're burying people for seven months. There's so many people that are killed in this war, it takes seven months to build massive graves and get all the bodies in it and cover them up. And then it says it takes them seven years of reclaiming all the stuff from the battlefield and using it. They're actually burning it and and using the war gear. So this can't be Revelation 19, 11 through 21. This could not, Ezekiel 38, cannot be the Battle of Armageddon. If it is, then, then God is, is making a conflict there. And so what we know is that the Bible never conflicts itself. And so if you look at, it, at Revelation 19, 11 to 21, the Battle of Armageddon, you see it clearly ends with Jesus Christ coming in the clouds at the head of the heavenly armies as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he says enough is enough, and he just ends it all and sets up his kingdom. So we know it's not then. What's the other time Gog and Magog show up? Well, it's just the next chapter in Revelation 20, 7 through 9. And Ezekiel is not describing that Gog and Magog because that Gog and Magog is at the end of what we call the millennium. Now, the word millennium is never in the Bible, but the number 7 times of 1,000 years is. And the Bible describes a period of time 1,000 years long seven times in Revelation 20. We call it the millennium. Uh, that's just the Latin word for a thousand. And so uh, the Greek word is kilial, kilialis. We're called kilios because we believe in the thousand-year reign. But that thousand-year reign is ended, if you look in Revelation 20 and verse 7, you don't have to right now, but write it down. It ends with Satan being released from prison. He's in prison for a thousand years. And he goes out and stirs up all the nations to come against Jerusalem again. 
And all the nations of the earth converge, and God just says, we're not even going to have a battle. And it says he just, he just destroys them all. And that's when we go right into the great white throne judgment. People accuse us as believers of, of uh, reading things into the Bible. So I wanted to show you how you arrive at the geographic and geopolitical players of Ezekiel 38 and 39. But, but uh, first of all, let's go to chapter 36. If, if I can go to 36. Connection lost. Oh, there. Connection unlost. Good. Uh, number one, it starts with God's promise to restore Israel as a nation. Look at Ezekiel 36, verses 22 uh, through 24. Now, this, this is God explaining his intentions. And this is what he says. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, verse 22, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. You see, Israel right now is an unwilling partner in this enterprise. God says, I am not protecting. I'm not protecting Israel from the whole world against them for Israel's sake. I'm doing it for my sake. See, that's what's shaping up in our world. There is an entire group of people, 1.2 billion of them, who at the core of their belief system believe in the, the, the inferiority, the, the um, destruction of, and the, the resist in every way, the Jewish people. And that's Islam. Islam is focused from its core against Israel. And God said, I am going to protect Israel, not for Israel's sake. They are, by nature, quite proud people. They are, by nature, um, you know, sometimes mistreating people around them because they've been mistreated so much. God is not vouching for the righteousness of the nation of Israel. When God does Ezekiel 38 and 39, he's not doing it because they are the most Uh, good Samaritan, you know, helpers of the poor in the world. He's doing it. I don't do this for your sake, so house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake. You see, when God makes an eternal covenant, when he sovereignly elects, he doesn't un-elect. And God sovereignly elected Israel. That's the the literal lineage of Abraham, not the spiritual descendants of Abraham. That's us. We are not Israel. Israel is Israel, and God has a a very clear plan for them, which you have profaned among the heathen whither you went. See, the the Jews have profaned the name of God among the heathen. Uh, They are God's chosen people of promise, and they denied their king when he came, Jesus Christ himself. So, and I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall, and this is one of the most repeated, in fact it is, the most repeated statement in the book of Ezekiel. Shall know that I am the Lord, shall know that I am the Lord, shall know that I am the Lord. The whole purpose of what God is doing with Israel is to show the world that he is the Lord. And really, if you want to know what the the conflict is, if you remember uh, on Mount Carmel, um, it was, is Baal the Lord, or uh, is, it was a conflict between Baal or Jehovah, Yahweh. And uh, now, and, and you know, that's Elijah and the fire came down and all of that. And so Baal was proven to not be the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh was. Well, today, the conflict that is coming to a head is Again, is it Allah? And, and I don't take Allah to be a generic name for God. Allah is defined. There are 99 titles for Allah. And he has his 99 names. And many of them, that's how Salman Rushdie got in trouble, you know, the author. Many of the names of Allah 
are names that are more associated with Lucifer and not with uh, the Lord God Almighty. And so the, the great conflict right now in our world is, is Allah the true God or Jehovah Yahweh the creator God, the God who eternally exists in three persons, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Or is it this... this um, kind of what, what we would call a Unitarian God, this, this one non-Trinitarian God. And by the way, uh, the Muslims and the Mormons have a lot in common. They both are this, this Unitarian view of God rather than a Trinitarian view. So, uh, but the whole thing is shaping up so that the world will know who the Lord is. And I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, for I will take you. So when is God saying this? He's saying this 2,600 years ago. God said through Ezekiel, remember Ezekiel, I showed you all the charts last week. He was in the second, you know, Daniel went in the first, Ezekiel went in the second, Babylonian uh, captivity. So 600 years before Christ, God said, I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of uh, all countries and will bring you into your own land. What countries was Israel in, in 600 BC? Well, some apostate northerners from Samaria were in Assyria. But when did Israel get into all countries? Well, it wasn't, it, and it wasn't in the Babylonian captivity either. They didn't go into countries, they went into Babylon, which swallowed up Assyria. So they just did a lateral. They went from one land to another. When, when did Israel need to get gathered out of all countries? It wasn't until A.D. 70 when the Romans banned them from the land of Israel and m killed a million of them and took everyone else they could get and s sold them into slavery all over the world. And the Jews were banned from the Holy Land, from the Holy City, especially Hadrian's time onward, and were sent all over the world, but look at this. I will gather you out of all countries. So 600, 2,600 years ago, 600 BC, God said, you're going to get sent to all the world, and that took place 600 years later when they were thrown out of uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land. But he said, sometime in the future, I'm going to gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. Own land. Israel from 600 or 586 B.C. didn't have their own land. They were always an occupied nation. They never, I mean, they had a little rebellion in the Maccabean time, but they were still, they were still occupied nation. They just were fighting off for a while, their occupiers. But Rome finally came and crushed that rebellion. So this, what's interesting is this part of what Ezekiel said it's only been since 1948 that Israel got their own land. You can put a date right there. They didn't have a land that was their own for 2,500 plus years, almost 2,600 years. So this is a fascinating, uh, if you want something fascinating, Ezekiel 36 is God saying, I have promised I'm going to restore Israel as a nation. And he said that as they were being carried off to Babylon. Uh, secondly, God gives us a picture. Look at chapter 37. I mean, if, you, if you've read it, you know what I mean. Uh, the Lord starts talking about when he does this, when he brings, see, when he brings them back, as, as we just were reading here, when he brings them back from among the heathen, it doesn't mean they're, they're believers, it doesn't mean that they're practicing servants and worshipers of the Lord. And so chapter 37 shows them, in God's sight, they were like bones that were all put back. It's like a, a big graveyard, and he takes the bones and builds a body out of it, but it's still dead. It's just, it's just in the shape of a body. Spiritually, there's no life. And so the restoration of Israel... They were brought back to life in the flesh. They became a real living nation, but they don't have the Spirit of God within them. 
they're trusting in their armaments and their expertise and their patents and their Nobel Prizes and their great riches. But the, the, what the Lord is doing is, Isaiah talked about too, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. God always is looking for this remnant. And, and tonight, nobody asked me about that, but the remnant is what you see in Zechariah 12 through 14 as God saves what Paul talks about in Romans 9 through 11. God saves all of Israel. All? What is all to God? All of the remnant, all of those who put their faith in Christ, all of those who look up and mourn for the one that they pierced. And so what's interesting is this, the spiritual element is just starting to dawn. In fact, I have a very dear friend who has spent most of his uh, recent adult life traveling a hundred and some times to Russia. And as you know, Russia has uh, disgorged itself of many Jews. And, and so that more than half of the population of Israel today is from Russia. Most people don't even realize that. Half of Israel is from Russia. They have come out of Russia in, in all those waves of Aliyah, of, of getting out of Russia and going to Israel. In fact, uh, if you look at, I mean, just the facts of it are unbelievable. How many of their prime ministers are Russian? I mean, the only reason in 1948 that Russia voted at the UN for Israel, they thought it was going to be a communist place because they had these collective farms and they were living on kibbutz. They all were from Russia anyway. They were going to come back to Mother Russia, so Russia just voted for them and didn't realize that they were helping God's plan to take place. But what has happened so far is just the, the unbelieving return and that has been fulfilled in the first half of the 19th century, 1948 in particular. So the Valley of Dry Bones has already been fulfilled in the sense of Israel going back to its, its uh, land. But the Spirit of God has not... I mean, can you, Israel, by the way, Israel's pretty powerful right now. Can you imagine when the Spirit of God is breathed into them? I mean, they're... they're uh, whatever, the third or fourth most powerful atomic power in the world. Undeclared, but they are. But can you imagine when the Spirit of God starts fighting their battles? Okay, now, let's go to chapter 38, because this is the heart of what we're going to cover for the next 15, 20 minutes. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little history lesson, because remember, my, my major work, both in undergrad and grad and postgrad, was all in history. Uh, church history and general history and history history. I love uh, history, but, but I want to show you how I see history. I don't see history uh, from our perspective. I like to go back and see how they looked at historical geography. So basically, uh, some of the, the pieces we have, if you look in chapter 38, it says, the word of the Lord came to be saying, verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, son of man, set your face against Gog of the, land, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh. Um, just, I mean, without, without any prophetic books, without Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth, which is a great book, um, without all that, what do the people that lived a long time ago say about this? Okay, Ezekiel was written... Ezekiel, here's for perspective, Ezekiel was written in the 6th century B.C. The 6th century B.C. Hesiod wrote in the 8th century B.C. He was writing 200 years before Ezekiel. This Greek teaching, didactic means teaching poet, equated the Magogians with the Scythians or Scythians. Now, that's a biblical word. In the New Testament, Paul said, for in Christ there's neither barbarian, uh, Jew, Greek, barbarian, bond, or free. And then he throws in Scythian. And that's the word that's usually used for barbarian, but it's actually the word Scythian. And in some versions of the Bible, you'll see that actual word in the New Testament. Also, when you get to Christ city, uh, that, that he ministered in called the Decapolis cities. Remember, Jesus in the Gospels is serving, uh, preaching in what is called the Decapolis. Um, 
Decapolis, one of the cities of the Decapolis, and the only one that Jesus ministered in, because it was the only one that was on this side of the Jordan River, is called Scythopolis. It's the city of the Scythians. So this man, living 200 years before Ezekiel, if, if you said the Magogians, the people of Magog, you don't have to read. You don't have to try and read modern. You know, people say, oh, you're just pushing the Russians into it. No. The Magogians in the 8th century BC were the Scythians. Now, Herodotus, he's called the father of history, just like we have the father of medicine and everything else uh, from the, the Greek uh, world. The father of history, now a century after. Now, look where we've gotten to. This is 100 years after Ezekiel. Herodotus called the, the Scythians the ones who were associated with Magog. So for 300 years, they have remained as, as being associated. And what he does, Herodotus tells us where they came from. He said they're a 10th century BC warrior group. And then we go into other Greek philosophers and Jewish ones, uh, Josephus, a historian. He, when Josephus talked about what, what we would know as the Great Wall of China, he called that area where the wall was built the ramparts of Gog and Magog, that the, the Chinese building their Great Wall were building it to hold out and hold back these northerners that were invading them, that, and they called the Great Wall the ramparts of Gog and Magog. So another interesting little piece, and this is from the first century. Now, um, when I used to travel uh, teaching in Bible institutes in, in Russia, we always would you know, fly through Moscow, and we'd go to the Kremlin and, and uh, just see another part of it. If you go through the Kremlin, it's like the Smithsonian. It's their history of their people, of the Russian people. In the last time I was in the Kremlin in 1999, I'm sure they've changed it, but the first exhibit in the Kremlin was how they showed that their ancestors were the Scythians who came from, and these are the, the Russian words, the Srubnaya and the Adronovo uh, people, that, and I'll show you a map of them, that were from the uttermost parts of the north. So, but without coming to our time and pushing something back, if you just look through history, you'll find that, that there has been a consistent description of the people. Now, this is what the world looked like in the time of the Bible. This is world geography at the time of the book of Revelation was being widely circulated. In fact, this is the view we as Westerners have of uh, the world. This was the center of the world in the Bible times. Of course, Rome dominated things. Uh, right here, you, you all know that's the Holy Land right there. Uh, and you can recognize Egypt down here. So where were these... Where were these Scythians from? They were from this part of the world, right up here. The Scythians, and that way, going to the far north. But they were known as the people that were, these are the Caucasus Mountains. And it's kind of like a little divider here on this, this between the, the Caspian and the uh, Black Sea. The, the Caucasus Mountains were kind of like a divider, and the Scythians were on one side, and the Roman Empire was on the other side. Now here, this divider is Parthia. Uh, Parthia, think of the Parthians. You can think of the Iranians. You can think of the Kurds. You can think of the Medes. That, that whole area was never conquered by the, the Romans. It was fought over and, and a lot of, of give and take. But the Parthian region was always uh, uh, kind of beyond the, the scope of the full control of the Roman Empire. So this is what the world looked like from the Westerners' view. And uh, for just a minute, look in your Bible. So uh, it, this would have been the map if you'd have gone to school with the Apostle John. You know, it's a little after him. It's Trajan's time, but it's very similar. So look down at, at Ezekiel 38, and I want to show you something. Um, it says, uh, uh, verse 5, from Persia, uh, from Cush, or Ethiopia, and from Libya, or if you have a version of the Bible, it could say put. 
You see that in verse 5? If you see those words like Persia, uh, Ethiopia, or Cush, and Libya, or Put, say yes. yes. You have those? Okay. Now, if you're going to school back then, uh, this is Libya, this, this region up here on the north part of Africa on, along the shore. Actually, uh, it would encompass what, what we would call Libya and Algeria and even Tunisia. Uh, it was that north shore. Um, Cush was what the region that was south of Egypt. Here's where Egypt ended. Down here was Cush. In fact, you remember Moses had a what wife? Cushite wife. She was not Egyptian. She was from south of Egypt, which is called Cush. Do you know what's down there now? Sudan. Do you know what Sudan thinks of Israel? Not very much. So, so look back at this list. In verse 5, Persia, that's this, this Parthian uh, area over here that to this day is not very happy about Israel. Uh, Libya, or Put, which is Algeria and Libya and Tunisia, Again, part of the North African Muslim uh, group of people that are not real excited about Israel's existence. Cush down here, Sudan, uh, actually is manufacturing missiles for Iran. So you can tell where their loyalties are. Um, and then it starts naming off in, in up here in verse 2, set your face against Gog and Magog, and the princes of Rosh and Meshech and Tubal. Uh, you know, Basically, it's talking about this whole region here, which would be modern-day Turkey, and the people from beyond the Caucasus, which are these Scythians. Okay, so that's just how Western civilization looks at it. Now, this is interesting. This is, if, if you are Oriental, if you're Chinese, um, and you look at history, China was always building, you know, I don't have room for the Great Wall over that way, but this is why they were building it. There were these people that were such skilled riders that they could ride at a full gallop with no saddle, holding on to the horse, and they could turn around in their horse at a full gallop, and they could shoot their bow and arrow at the people behind them. They were the most feared fighters of the ancient world because, and they had these secret, nobody knew how they got them, silk vests. Now silk was not bulletproof, but when an arrow hit silk, it didn't penetrate the silk. It just went in and they were able to pull the arrow out and they didn't get infected. They only got injured. And those silk shirts were, which they, they had learned how to, uh, um, you know, in the, in the Chinese guarded the silk secret for centuries. But the Scythians were these fearsome warriors that would come down from this region up here that's called the steppes. Uh, it's just gradual higher and higher hills. And again, you can see the Caucasus Mountains here. And so they didn't come down this way because the Parthian kingdom and, and some of these, you know, the, the tribal areas that are in modern Afghanistan and all that, they would come up this way and would come into the land and come down and would bother all of the Babylonians and Assyrians. And they, they did make it, by the way. The Scythians made it to right there. That's where Scythopolis is. That's their furthest south penetration. They came from up there into the Holy Land right there. So that's how the Chinese would think about it. This is how, uh, if, if you look at the world empires, this is basically Alexander the Great. You remember Alexander's, uh, uh, he was from somewhere, his father was the king of Macedonia, but, but he was from somewhere over here, I don't know where, I've been to his grave, but somewhere over there in Greece. And, and he took his father's empire and just whirlwind, took it all the way to India. But again, you notice what he didn't do. He didn't go past here, and he didn't go past here. Why? Because that's where these Scythians were, and they were so powerful that they just kept up there. So that's just another view of the empires. Now this is what's fascinating. This is a Russian map. I love it. Uh, this is what they had in the um, uh, Kremlin. 
and see the Srubnayas and the Androvos, and you can see the colors. And these two groups merged into, uh, this is talking about just after the time of, of Abraham, those two groups were merging together and became the Scythians. But you notice, this is Moscow, and these are the steppes of Russia. So, and, and this is Siberia. So, I mean, let me ask you, like I said last time, if I said uh, it's between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan and south of, you know, Lake Superior, what would I be talking about? Well, if you say it's from the far north, it's the, the Scythian people, it's the people that live north of the Caucasus, the people that live north of the description that, that we would have of Turkey, without any prophetic writer, you can figure out who they're talking about. They're talking about these, these people from the far north that were such fearsome fighters who became today known as the Russians. But back then, they had all these other terms. So, who participates in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Well, this, what the event is, and if we had time, and we don't tonight, to read the whole account, it's fascinating. God himself stops an invasion of Israel. And who's invading Israel? Magog, who all the ancient writers associate with these people that live up there beyond the Caucasus Mountains and eastern Anatolia, you know, they, they, they even broke in so far as eastern Turkey. But it's not clear when it happens. That's the only thing we're not sure. I mean, no Bible scholar disputes that it's going to happen. It's just we don't know when it's going to happen. But who is it? Well, it's, I mean, look in your Bible. We'll, we'll list them off. Verse 5 has Persia, a.k.a. Iran. Um, the the uh, Cush is next, which, you know, your Bible might say Ethiopia, but that's really South Cush. If you want all Cush, you've got to have Sudan, too. Put which is the north shore, I mean the north part of Africa, the south shore of the Mediterranean, which is Libya, Algeria, might even be Tunisia. Uh, Gomer, which is an, and, uh, um, another term for Turkey. And then Togarma, which could easily be all of these, uh, what we call the stands, you know, the, the uh, Tajikistan and Kazakhstan and, and all the stands, which are basically um, Muslim today. And then Meshach and Tubal, which are the ancient Scythians and modern Russians. So who participates? Wow. Right now, every day, if you, if you follow Google, they are threatening to destroy Israel. Um, these people today are making missiles to destroy Israel. These people are giving all their armaments now that Muammar Gaddafi is gone to all. I mean, most of Libya's armaments are now in the hands of the, the, the antagonists surrounding Israel. Uh, Turkey, uh, you know, they keep, they're part of NATO, but they, they keep wish-washing on us. The, it's interesting, right now the Central Asian Muslims are not really against Israel. In fact, they're letting them base their airplanes there right now, which is fascinating. Uh, but they'll change their mind. And, of course, Russia has warned Israel flatly to leave Syria alone. So, back to when is Ezekiel 38 and 39? I don't know. But whenever it is, it's very interesting what happens. And what happens is, if you read this, God wades in and, and stops this group from attacking Israel. And it appears if it's before the tribulation, if it is here, um, and we're right there on this chart. So if it's any time in the near future, then it, it appears from what it says that Israel suffers so greatly in this battle. Even though the Lord fights for them, they, they suffer and they have to surrender uh, some of their, it could be that they even give up their atomic weapons, which would be the, the bottom line for Israel. Um, you know, they have submarines, they have missiles, and they have airplane-delivered atomic bombs. Um, if they do that, that's when this covenant 
gets, when, when a, as we saw last time, when a ruler of the people that destroyed Jerusalem, who destroyed Jerusalem? The Romans. So when a continuation of the Roman Empire ruler makes a covenant with Israel, and what it could look like is that Europe says, we will make uh, a, a seven-year promise to you that Russia, Iran, China, you name it, if they attack you, they're attacking us. So we will guard you, Israel. But in order to make the Muslims not be so upset, if you'll give up your 250 nuclear thermonuclear weapons, we will defend you. And uh, it appears that this Antichrist is so winsome and, and makes them feel so secure that they make a seven-year promise to let him defend them. And that's, that's what kicks off what God calls the tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. And in the middle is the abomination that causes desolation. By the way, a temple is rebuilt in here somewhere because there's a temple at the midpoint of the tribulation. And uh, that's basically the, uh, what Ezekiel 38 and 39. So whoever asks that, I don't know when it's going to take place. But boy, it could take place this week, the way things are going. I don't know if you noticed, but the Russians gave the Syrians one of the most powerful surface-to-surface -surface missiles there is. It is so hypersonic that even America can't stop it. It travels uh, so rapidly, it's an unstoppable missile that's just across the border in Syria. Okay, um, if you look at, back at Ezekiel 38.6, just one last little clue here, what we're talking about. 38.6, it says uh, that, that they are from the far north. So what, what I've shown you is, right here is the Holy Land. And so this is north, and this is north, and this is north, and this is north, and this is further north, and this is further north, and this is really far north. You understand, if, if your orientation is Israel, then, then the, all of these, this coming group is from the north. Even these, what we would call the stands that are right across here, uh, those with Russia uh, are all what would be in verse, now look at verse 15, I mean it's just repeated over and over again, Isaiah, or Ezekiel 38, 15, then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many people with you, and then it says the same thing at the beginning of chapter 39, verse 2, I will turn you around, and by the way, this is what is fascinating, uh, this is God's intervention, uh, uh, chapter 39, verse 1, and you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, by the way, Gog is, is kind of like Pharaoh. It's not really a name, it's a title. It's this um, um, high up person like a Pharaoh. And say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. Now it's interesting, there's a variant here. If you have a King James, it says the sixth part of you. And, and that textual variant is very interesting. It could mean, and this is what is fascinating, that whatever army comes uh, from the north onto, uh, from the north, let's say that an army of uh, 60,000 comes down. Let, let's say that they, they get a Iranian, um, you know, inner independent states of... Uh, across here, these Muslim states, and some Russian troops, and some Turkish troops, and all the rest of them. Let's say that 60,000 of them come. The variant in that second verse that says in the King James, the sixth part, actually what it means is that five-sixths don't return. So it would be if an army of 60,000 came, only 10,000 would survive the attack on Israel. And so it, it, in the old King James, it's very interesting that it, whatever happens, whatever the Lord does is significant, and it defeats them. And uh, then if you read verse 3, he knocks the bow out of their hand. They fall on the mountains of Israel. And then he starts talking about what he sends, um, the, the, the pestilence and everything that comes upon them. And then what's fascinating is, 
uh, if you look in verse 9, and this is just what's very interesting um, in our terms. Uh, Those who dwell in the cities of Israel go out and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the javelins and the spears, and they will make fires with them for seven years. And they will not take wood from the field nor cut down any from the forest because they will make fires with the weapons that they will plunder those who plundered them and pillage those who pillaged them, says the Lord. That is really interesting. What, what, what weaponry could come from the north that would burn for seven years? And it's interesting to think about. I mean, even Hal Lindsey brought that up, that the half-life of radioactive material is seven years, and it's very possible they just pull all the warheads out because the Lord actually sends pestilence and kills all of these soldiers. One last thing that's just fascinating, too. Look at verse 11. It will come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a burial place in Israel and the valley, and those who pass by east of the sea will obstruct travelers because they will bury Gog and his multitude, and they will call it the valley of Haman Gog, and for seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. And then it talks about there's going to be these people that are going to go out and set up markers. Look at verse 14. And they will set apart men regularly employed with help of a search party to pass through the land and bury those bodies remaining on the ground in order to cleanse it. And they will set a marker by it and haul it off to that spot. And if we get back to a little enlarged map of Israel here, what it's talking about is it says east of the sea. This is the the Dead Sea right here. You can't see it. It's really small. But they want them buried east of the Dead Sea because the people of Israel live here. What would you call that? You call that isolation. You would say that the bodies are contaminated. This is exactly, if there was any kind of weapons of mass destruction event, the cleanup of it from the mountains of Israel would be taken over into that desert area. They wouldn't want it near the populace. And so it's just, I mean, you know, if, if it happens into the future, you know, maybe we'll get away from atomic weaponry. But if it happens anytime now, and all of these armies come down converging from Russia with their tactical nuclear weapons, and God stops them here, Israel cleans them up, takes the contaminated bodies and that the Lord kills with plagues, buries them east downwind of the Dead Sea, and takes the radioactive fuel and powers Israel. That's just one scenario. The other scenario is, it's very interesting that uh, uh, in the last few weeks, Israel has been found, if we export to them our fracking technology that's, you know, controversial in America, Israel will have 250 billion barrels of oil if they can frack. Saudi Arabia has 260 billion. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that's not prophetic. That's from Bloomberg. Uh, Israel is amazing. So, okay, interesting times ahead. Uh, Let me get to the last slide, and it's time to go. You guys have been sitting way too long. And um, uh, basically this. this, the, The scene of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is not Armageddon. Armageddon is described in the Bible as the Antichrist coming, the kings of the south coming, the kings of the east coming, the kings of the north coming. That is completely different than this event right here, this Magog invasion, which is only from the north. So the the events don't confuse Ezekiel 38 and 39 with the final battle in the hill of Megiddo. So there we go. Uh, My goal was before we were snowed in that we'd finish, and that's it. So um, next time we're going to actually have questions from the floor. I'm sure I've said more than enough here to confuse everybody. And so we'll have our microphones out next time and you can say, wait a minute, what does this mean? And um, we will try and put the pieces together. But let's all stand and get the blood flowing. And uh, let's thank the Lord uh, tonight that there are no accidents with God. Everything is being orchestrated by our God of the universe, and and it's all in his mind, centering around Israel. He's going to get Israel isolated. He's going to get them so that everybody in the world is against them, and and even are going to be attacked by one of the greatest groups that could possibly oppose them. And in that moment, he's going to save them so that all the world will know who's the real God. And even after he does that, the world doesn't want him. And so don't be discouraged. Just be faithful sharing the gospel. Now, this is what is fascinating. Um, 
I could read about the coming reign of Christ in verse 24, but let's get to 38. This is what is so fascinating. This, these verses were written, Ezekiel was written uh, 2,700 years ago. And 2,700 years ago, uh, God said, now this is 2,700 years ago, 2,600 and change, verse chapter 38. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, against Magog, the princes of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. I'm not going to get into, you know, what geographic areas there are. You can read in the study Bible. What I like is verse 5. 2,700 years ago, it said that chief among the coalition that comes in verse 4 against Israel with all of their army, horses, horsemen, and splendidly clothed, great company, bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Verse 5 says, Persia. Head of the list. Do you remember with Daniel, who was so resisting Daniel as he prophesied about the future of Israel? In Daniel, who resisted him? The prince of Persia. The prince of Persia is a demon that is watching over the enmity that Iran still has against Israel. There's no country on earth that is more vitriolic and murderously, uh, in the press at least, I don't think the individual people of Iran, the Iranians aren't that way, but their leadership currently is. Currently. In the 70s, the Shah of Iran was kind of a friend of the West. But since the overthrow in the Islamic Revolution, Persia leads the pack of the most frequent haters of Israel. And they, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, are all of them with shield and helmet. And verse 6 you can read, uh, prepare and be ready. Your companies are gathered about you, verse 7. Verse 8, after many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. So Persia and company are going to march in attack against a, the Bible says, a regathered Israel. There is going to be a regathering of a nation, their own land. I read it over and over and over again. And that regathered nation is going to, in verse 8, after many days you will be visited. In the latter years you'll come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from the peoples and the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, and you and your troops. Thus says the Lord, verse 10, on that day it shall come to pass that, that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people. I'll dwell safely. And on and on it goes. And they plan this invasion against a people, verse 12, gathered from the nations. And they've acquired all this wealth. And then it, it keeps talking about, verse 15, then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you. Riding on horses, a great company, a mighty army, you'll come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I'm hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. And the rest is fascinating to read. Verse 19, there'll be a great earthquake. And uh, verse 21, I will cause a sword against Gog. What happens is the Lord actually protects Israel. Boy, is that an interesting thing. I wonder how the news will cover that when this happens. Watch this. And I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, with bloodshed. I will rain down on him and his troops, on the many people who are with him, flooding, rain, great hailstones, fire, brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and it will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Now you see the last part of verse 23, chapter 37, verse 23? Did you know that's the 56th time that little phrase has occurred in this book? Then they shall know that I am the Lord. Do you know what the theme of Ezekiel is? God says, I'm going to intervene in human history so that all the nations will know that I am the Lord. Wow. 
and verse 39, or I mean chapter 39, I will turn you around, verse 2, and lead you and bring you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And I will knock, verse 3, the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and your troops. And verse 6, then they shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. And on and on it goes. And, and I like verse 17. In fact, I shared this when I was there. Did you know that Israel is the, is the spot between the three continents where over 30%, some say 40, some depends on which sign you're reading, half, some signs say, of all the birds on earth migrate over the, that, that little area of Israel between Africa, Asia, and Europe. And look what it says here, verse 17. Speak to every sort of birds, to every beast of the field. Israel is one of the greatest uh, ornithological, you know, bird-watching places there is. And, and every sort of bird and every kind of beast, and they gather to eat. Horsemen, you can read it, verse 19. Eat till you're full. Wow. Why? Verse 22, so they'll know that I'm the Lord. Wow. Okay. Uh, basically this. Psalm 102 talks about a suffering psalmist and it seems to have a near and far fulfillment and it talks about a people that are baked and in graves and they are recovered and sent back to a land in Ezekiel 36 onward talks about the land, the land, the land, the land, the land, the land, the land in your own land, your own land, your own land, and I will bring you back from all the nations. And when that's happening, 38 and 39 talk about an event that is described in the final passage we're going to go through, Zechariah 12 to 14. So let's turn there before we run out of time. And Zechariah 12 to 14 is absolutely fascinating. Basically, Zechariah tells us, if that prophet fills in the details. And it starts out in Zechariah 12, first with God's calling card. You know, if you're going to have someone, you know, like people that are going to have surgery, they, they look up the doctor and see. I mean, I don't know if you drive around very much. I see billboards all the time that say that we are the top hospital in whatever. And everyone advertises, we're the top whatever hospital. And so you always check their credentials. Look at God's credentials. Chapter 12 of, of Zechariah, verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord. You want to know who I am? He says. I am the one who stretches out the heavens. So he is the one who created the cosmos. He is the one. And he talks about creation as stretching out the heavens. I am the one that lays the foundation of the earth. So this is not only the universe. He's also the architect of the earth. And I'm also the one, he said, that forms the spirit of man within him. Now what's interesting is if, if you read the Septuagint, there are interesting words here. Cosmos, geos, numas. God said, I am the one that began this, the universe, that laid the foundation of this, the earth, and that puts the pneumas, the spirit within man. Now look what he says, verse 2. He said, so you should listen to me. Do you know anybody else that made the universe? I'm the only one, God said. So verse 2, behold, I will make Jerusalem. This is the most mentioned geographic spot in the Bible 800 plus times Jerusalem's big to God Jerusalem is the city he chose and, and it's inhabited by the people he chose and placed his name upon behold I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people who lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem and it shall happen, now look at verse 3, because there's a repetition here that's fascinating. Starting in verse 3, he talks about a specific time. He says, in that day. 
And, and if you notice, I'll, I'll note them for you. It's all the way through this. This is one event he's talking about. And it shall happen in that day, verse 3, that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the people. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Can you, now just for a moment, because when we walk down from the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane, which is part of almost every Holy Land trip, as you're walking down the Palm Sunday Road, and all you alumni know what I'm talking about, it's that steep, narrow road where cars are passing you, and there's an entire graveyard on one side, and olive trees on the other side, and you're on this narrow road, and you're, you're scooching along trying to go down this steep road on the Palm Sunday Road. When you go down that road, notice what this says. Though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it, one thing you pass on the road on the way down, the first thing on the left, there's a gate, tomb of the prophets. That's where Zechariah purportedly is buried. Can you imagine Zechariah in 600, uh, 500 and something B.C., 600 and something B.C.? The Lord's inspiring him, and he's writing down. And by the way, he's looking at Jerusalem, and Jerusalem's burned out, blackened. The walls are all knocked down. Temple's gone. He's looking, and the Lord says in verse 3, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it, and Zechariah said, all? You want me to write that down? Here? This is nowhere. This is nothing. Now, I know he didn't say that, but can you imagine how hard it was for him to write this? That Jerusalem is going to be a cause for all peoples. God does not exaggerate. All want to heave it away. All the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Is there any, have all the nations of the earth ever gathered against any, any city on earth? I mean, are all the nations of the earth against New York? No. Are all of them against Moscow? No. But all of them are going to be against Jerusalem. It's the only city that, that gets global coverage. Now look at verse 4. In that day... Here it is again, verse 6, in that day, uh, verse 8, in that day, in verse 9, it should be in that day, look at verse 11, in that day, chapter 13, in that day, it's the same day, this is a big event, it shall be verse 2, in that day, verse 4 of chapter 13, in that day, so we're talking about the day of the Lord, which happens to be the second coming of Christ. And what we're reading here is what precipitates the second coming of Christ. You know, it's interesting, uh, all the people, there was another prediction. It was October 7th, which didn't happen. Uh, again, they're off. But God has planned that day. And this is what happens in that day. Verse 6, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the wood pile, like a fiery torch in the sheaves. That means very flammable. And the Lord will save, verse 7, the tents of Judah. In that day, verse 8, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The feeble among them in that day, verse 8 says, will be like David. What is that? David, David never lost a battle. And the Lord said, I'm, gonna, I'm going to settle the score for all the, the hatred against Israel. Verse 9, in that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. What, by the way, is Armageddon? Armageddon is the staging area, which, by the way, it's first mentioned in Revelation 16, and then it's mentioned again in Revelation 19. And what it is is Armageddon, Har, actually it's Har in Hebrew, it's Har Megiddo. It's the hill of Megiddo. Har is hill, Megiddo is a city. So the plain around the hill of Megiddo is the staging area for the final assault on Jerusalem. And all the armies of the world are gathering there for their final assault on Jerusalem. And, and the, the spearhead is already in Jerusalem, and they're already ravaging the city. You can read it here. Um, in fact, it says, if you look at chapter 13, it shall come to pass, verse 8, in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die. So... Two-thirds of all the Jews will be wiped out, exterminated, killed, massacred. Two-thirds. They just passed, finally, this past year, Israel has as many people as they had 
known Jews before the Holocaust. They finally reached the same number that they had before 1945. And it was a momentous event when they celebrated how many uh, Jews that they had living in the land. Uh, and they celebrated when, when they crossed that threshold. But two-thirds of them shall be cut off and die. But look at verse 8. But one-third shall be left in it. And I will bring the one-third through the fire. So God says, I'm going to bring one-third of the Jews through this deadly holocaust and that's what we call the remnant. And that is what Paul was talking about in Romans 9 through 11 when he says, all Israel will be saved. They will be. A lot of people don't like that. They say, oh, it's not fair. Everybody else, we have to send them to Billy Graham crusade and they have to walk the aisle or a Southern Baptist church and they go forward an invitation and how come they get special treatment? Well, I wouldn't say it's very special. You, you've watched, uh, I mean, the, the, the events, they're, they're cut off, they're ravished. They're, I mean, it, it says that, that they are terribly, uh, the women are raped and they're murdered and two-thirds of them are horribly killed. But one-third shall be saved. Now, keep, keep reading. Let's go back to chapter 12. I missed verse 10. Uh, and I will pour on the house of David, Zechariah 12.10, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You should see how covenant theologians interpret this. The church has never been called the house of David. Now, some charismatic churches might be called the house of David, or a messianic church might be called the house of David, but the church has never in the Bible been called the house of David. We certainly don't live in Jerusalem. I mean, there is a church in Jerusalem. There's a Jerusalem assembly. But this is talking about people, Jews, that are descendants of Abraham that, that are called the house of David, that are living in Jerusalem. But look what happens in verse 10. This, this is what Paul's talking about in Romans 9 through 11. And the spirit of grace and supplication I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieves for him as one who grieves for a firstborn son. Now, did you catch who is talking here? It says in verse 10, they will look on me whom they pierced. Who is the me of Zechariah 12.10. We'll back up. Who is talking? Look at verse 9. It shall be in that day I. So it's the me is the I of verse 9. Back up to verse 8. In that day the Lord. Ah. Verse 7. The Lord will save. Verse 6. I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan. Back up to verse 4. In that day says the Lord I. Who's talking? Jehovah. Yahweh. The me is Yahweh or Jehovah. There's no J in Hebrew. It's a, actually a Y sound, but Jehovah is Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. Look at verse 3. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem. Who is talking? Verse 1, the word of the Lord. The one who made the cosmos, laid the foundations of the geos, and forms the pneumas, the spirit. That's who's talking. But verse 10 says, they will look on me. When's the only time that Yahweh was pierced? How do you pierce God? How do you pierce the God of the universe, who's a spirit and doesn't have a physical body? One place. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world. Jesus Christ is God the Son. And God, Jehovah, was pierced by a Roman spear on a cross. And when they look on me, which is Jesus Christ, Christ on the cross, look at verse 11, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. 
You know what, collectively, the remnant, the one-third of Jews that survived the, Holocaust, the final Holocaust in Jerusalem, they will start mourning. You know what they're going to say? Oh, we can't believe we didn't, that our forefathers rejected him and crucified. We can't believe that all these centuries we've, we've been blinded and, and rejected him. But look at chapter 13, verse 1. In that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. How, how are all Israel saved? The same way you and I are saved. They will begin mourning for their sins, for their rejection, for their unbelief. And the spirit of grace and supplication, how did we get saved? Same way. The Jews don't get saved any differently than we do. I just had a mother telling me the gospel. They happen to have all of them massacred and the Lord coming back in the sky. But it's very similar. The Lord did both of them. And that day, says the Lord, every prophet is going to be ashamed. Well, here's the ending because it's time to go to our uh, reception time. Look at chapter 14. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. That's the second coming. The day of the Lord, it's called the day of the Lord all the way through the prophets. Your spoil will be divided. I will gather all the nations. This is kind of like a review. Chapter 12, 13, and 14 just keep flashing back and forth of the same event. It's that day. But I will gather all nations to battle against Jerusalem. And that's Revelation 16, 13 to 16. If you read that, it talks in Revelation. See, the book of Revelation is seeing this event in Zechariah. It's filling in the details. But all the nations to battle against Jerusalem, they're staging up there in Armageddon, and the, the front end of the army is coming down. And look what they're doing. The city shall be taken, verse 2 of chapter 14. The houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city goes into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And the Lord will go forth. This is the second coming of Christ. Now we're in Revelation 19, verse 11 onward. The Lord will go forth. He will fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. So what happens? Armageddon is in the north uh, of Jerusalem, up in uh, south of the Sea of Galilee, and the Lord is on his way to save his people in Jerusalem, and in a flyover, he destroys all the armies of the world, which is a word. Kills them all. And uh, in fact, it's, it's very uh, gruesome how it happens. It says he will fight uh, the battle in verse 3. As in the day of battle, in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. That's the second coming, and Jesus promised that, uh, that he would return. And he comes back actually to the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the mount is split, and it goes from east to west. And thus, look at verse 5. By the way, we're in here. Aren't you excited? We show up. The end of verse 5. It says, if you keep reading, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, and the valley shall reach to Azal, and you shall flee as in the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Jordan. Thus the Lord my God will come, and all the saints with you. Wow. All the saints come with Christ in the second coming. That's, that's why the rapture takes place before it. He's got to get the saints to him. And we come, in fact, I tell a lot of people, they say, oh, I can't afford to go to Israel. I said, don't worry, you'll go on a Holy Land trip on horseback. <laughs> in Revelation 19, it says, all the hosts of heaven arrayed in white garments are behind Christ. He's at the head, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and fanning out behind him are all the angels and all the saints. Did you know Jude records the first biblical prophecy about the second coming of Christ? It's Enoch, and it says, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints in fiery vengeance, executing uh, wrath against the ungodly for all their ungodly deeds. That's in the book of Jude, quoting Enoch about the second coming of Christ. And on and on it goes. But look at verse 12. I want to end with this. This is better than any movie. And it says, Zechariah 14, 12. This is what happens to all the armies that have come in Revelation 16 to Armageddon and they are streaming down and ravaging and raping and pillaging and killing and everything the Jews. Verse 12, and it shall be, this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fight against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. 
See, God doesn't mess around. There's not a shot fired. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Kind of sounds like a neutron bomb, where it just destroys the people, and there's no physical damage to the buildings. And it shall come to pass, verse 13, in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up. So there will be survivors, but, but the game plan has changed. Until we get to verse 35, and then Daniel switches gears. And most Bible commentators say that in verse 36, we're looking forward to what we would call the tribulation time in the Antichrist. Now, why am I saying all that? Because what you get from Daniel is, Daniel 10 tells us that there is a Persian connection. Uh, there's something going on with Persia uh, that is specifically pointed out by God. Now, go to Ezekiel. I want to show you uh, Ezekiel 38 because we have our second Persian um, just back up a book. Uh, Ezekiel actually was captured and went to the land before uh, land of Babylon before Daniel. There were three times the Babylonians uh, took prisoners and uh, most likely in the first of the uh, times Ezekiel was taken and the second uh, uh, group Another group came, and then Daniel went in the final one in 586. But uh, look at chapter 38, and this is what's so interesting. Uh, now the word of the Lord came to me. I'm in Ezekiel chapter 38, and said, Son of man, set your face against Gog in the land of Magog. Uh, the prince of Rosh, actually Rosh means prince, so it's the, the prince or Rosh of Meshach and Tubal. So Rosh doesn't seem to be a separate geographic place it's it's a rosh is always used as a kind of a title um like pharaoh pharaoh isn't a name it's a title it's like president you know we talk about the president we know who we're talking about but you know in future if we just say the president they don't know which one unless they can date us well this this rosh thing is a prince so it's whoever is the prince in meshach and tubal so that's great and you know it doesn't really matter but, but look at what it says if you keep going down to verse 5. It says, there are going to be all of these who come against Israel. And I only want you to see the, the first one in verse 5. I mean, all of them are significant because, I mean, just last week, the whole Ethiopia and Somalia and the, the massacre of the 147 kids in the Christian university in Kenya... I mean, the, the Muslims came in at gunpoint, separated the, the Christians from the other Muslims, let the Muslims leave, and they butchered the Christians. I mean, this, this, this whole uh, uh, stirring up of the South the Bible talks about, it's interesting to watch it start. But verse 5, what I want you to see is in Ezekiel 38, who's at the head of the line? that's coming against Israel in verse 5. What's the first word there in your Bible? Say it out loud. Persia. So we know that Daniel saw there is the Persian politics were being deeply behind the scenes influenced by this high-ranking principality and power, this, this demon over a country. Now there's another demon over Greece. He seems to be wasting money right now if you're following, you know, uh, current world news. You know, the Greeks are going broke uh, and falling out of the euro. But, and I'm just teasing about that. Probably there's some uh, prophetic implication to that. But what, what we see is this Persian deal figures in to Ezekiel 38 saying that there is going to be a coming invasion of Israel that is headed up by Persia. Now, why is that? 
Well, if you read the rest, why is that important? If you look at all those other names in verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, and with them, and, and all the house of Gomer, and Togarma, and Meshach, and Tubal, and all that, that group never in history has ever done anything together. This, this is an historical anomaly looking back. Never in history has Persia, Sudan, Libya, Algeria, Turkey, Central Asia, never have they all attacked Israel, ever. This is a coalition coming. And Ezekiel says, the one that's going to rev it up is Persia. If you want to find Persia in the news, it's called Iran. There is no nation on earth that has threatened Israel more completely for annihilation. Now, Hitler just wanted to kill Jews. He didn't care about Israel. He just wanted to kill Jews. The Soviets pogromed the Jews until a million of them fled and went to Israel. I mean, we know history. I mean, the, the Spanish martyred and killed the Jews, and on and on. The Crusaders killed the Jews. But no country has so frequently, publicly, categorically, even this week said, there's no reason for Israel to continue to exist, and we will destroy them. Not just we don't like them, we're going to boycott them, we're going to apartheid them and economically ruin them. We are going to kill them. Now, last thing, because it's time to go. There's something that always identifies where Satan is involved. Um, he, it says in John 44, Satan was a murderer from the beginning. Satan, Satan is always close to murder. And, and bloodshed and killing. It's almost like a fly. Satan loves killing. That's why I would strongly encourage you, if you're a young man and you have any desire to serve the Lord, you need to abandon killing video games because you're honoring the devil. They're not neutral. Satan came to kill and steal and destroy. Those are the three themes of most male-dominated video games. Killing, stealing, destroying. You know, uh, what is it? Grand auto theft, stealing, and killing and destroying are all the rest. Satan's realm. He's a murderer. He loves bloodshed. He loves destruction. He calls his demons Abaddon, Destroyer, and all that. And this is all the video game stuff. Satan is one who comes to kill and steal and destroy. When Satan is influencing a nation, they only talk about killing and destroying. And I'm not talking about the Persian people. I think the, the Iranian people today, I mean, I, I baptized several, and, and I count Iranians as some of my dear friends. I'm not talking about the Iranian people. I'm talking about the nation of Iran in the hands of its current leaders who are tied to high-up principalities have this unhuman, it's demonic, it's not human, it's a demonic passion to destroy God's chosen people of promise, the Jewish people. And how does it all end? And I'll end now because we only have four minutes. Go to Revelation 12 because what's really interesting is the end of the Bible is all built around all this stuff that Daniel and Ezekiel talk about. God kind of wires it all together. If, if you look at the Bible, there's uh, prophecies uh, in Genesis, in Deuteronomy, a uh, few in the Psalms, uh, a lot in Jeremiah, a lot more in Ezekiel, and then Daniel and Zechariah. Those are all kind of streams of prophecies uh, about the last days, but all of them are wired into the book of Revelation. And that's what makes Revelation so interesting. The revelation of Jesus Christ has 404 verses, and it has 800 quotations and allusions to 
there's even some in Exodus. Uh, to all these, these Old Testament books are all feeders into. You can't really understand Revelation without following the, the trails back to what it's talking about. And look at chapter 12. This is just phenomenal. And uh, uh, I think I passed Mr. Tibble's question, but I'll just read this and then we'll quit. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head was a garland of 12 stars. And what on earth would that be? Well, if you go back to Genesis... And you look in the life of Joseph, Genesis 37 to 50, bingo. You know what that's talking about. That's a description of Israel. That's a description of the 12 tribes and and the whole thing that that Joseph saw when his brothers were, you know, he saw all of that. It's interesting. Okay, so we've got Israel. And being with child, so Israel has a child. That's interesting. And then comes this dragon. And now it sounds kind of like we're in Lord of the Rings stuff or something. I mean, it sounds like science fiction. And verse 4, the dragon gets a third of the stars. That's where we get Satan getting a third of all the angels. That He got one third of all that they fell with him. But look at verse 4 at the ending. It was ready to give birth to devour her, that's Israel's, child as soon as it was born. And if you have certain versions of the Bible, child is capitalized. This is talking about Christ. So the nation of Israel had Christ, you know, through Mary and, you know, through the seed of of the woman. And we've talked about the virgin birth and everything, but it was was through the line of of David and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the the 12 tribes and all that. But look what happens. Verse 5, she bore the male child who was to rule all nations. That's Christ with a rod of iron. That's Psalm 2. I mean, all this stuff is just wired back to the rest of the Bible. And her child was caught up to God. Now, that's the end of the 40 days after the resurrection, the ascension. Jesus went up. And so the woman fled in the wilderness, and God prepared a place for her for three and a half years. And war broke out in heaven, verse 7. And Michael and his angels fought with a dragon. And all of a sudden... We are seeing in Revelation that Satan has one goal, and he's going to use the nations of the world that will be usable, but Satan's goal is, he has one goal. He wants to destroy Israel because God made a sovereign election of Israel, and if Satan can destroy them all, it ruins God's plan. And so the whole book of Revelation is all tying together the promises of God that he has sovereignly made to his people, Israel. Why do you think God parks his throne over Jerusalem? If if the church took Israel's place, he should park his throne over Rome. You know, the Roman Catholic Church. Or maybe over I don't know, Nashville or something. I mean, why does he park it over Jerusalem? Because he has sovereignly elected Israel, and the whole end of the world is all of these prophecies being revealed in how God defeats the devil, and especially when you get to Zechariah, Satan gets every nation on earth to march against Israel. Not Rome, and not Washington, Jerusalem. Every nation on earth starts going toward Israel. And Zechariah 12 through 14 says that at the last moment, God rescues Israel. And Israel, Jews, look up and see the one they pierce and mourn and are gloriously saved. So, Mr. Tibble, thank you for asking that. You're not even here tonight. Um, But I'll answer it anyway. Uh, In modern news, fascinating is, there's a Persian connection to Ezekiel 38, which ties the devil into desiring to destroy Israel. And the current nation he's really fomenting is Iran. And in verse 5 of Ezekiel 38, Iran leads the pack against Israel.